What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with me, your host. Uh, my name is Chad Medved, and welcome to the podcast. First thing is first, if you could, if you would be so kind, uh, please scroll up on the podcast app that you're listening to right now and rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It is a huge help for me. I cannot thank you enough if you already have done it. If you haven't, please just take a couple seconds and do it for me. I'm, at, uh, I'm trying to break 200 reviews on there, you know, five Five stars. Uh, I'm killing it. You know, I'm trying to at least. Um, and I would just, uh, I would really appreciate it if you took a minute and uh, shared some kind words with me and uh, smash that subscribe button and uh, give me a little uh, five star review if you could. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about. So Christmas is obviously coming up. All right. I'm not rushing everyone out of October. I'm not rushing everyone out. Uh, into the holiday of Christmas, but Turner Dairy Farms, you know, Turner's, Turner's Premium Tea, you know who I'm talking about? Obviously you do. Uh, they are proud sponsors of the podcast and uh, they have just released a brand new Turner's, well, I guess it's not released yet, but there's a pre-order up for a Turner's fully knitted sweater. There's two different kinds, and uh, if you're looking for a, you know, everyone got ugly sweater parties, who knows if we'll have any this year because of this damn virus, but uh, these fully knitted sweaters are, you know, they're crazy. Uh, TurnerDairy.net, hop on over, uh, they have a place called The Shop, and uh, you could pick up a brand new fully knit sweater, All right, you got one that's um, Pittsburgh's favorite tea sweater, and it got some Turner's logos, got some tea on there, and then it got Santa's favorite milk, and it's uh, Old St. Nick, you know, carrying a big-ass jug of, uh, you know, the Turner's milk, so hop on over there, and uh, the shop is in the link in the bio if you want to go to their Instagram, at Turner's PGH, or you can just go to turnerdairy.net, and uh, up at the top, you'll see something called the shop, and you can get on there, pre-order one of these fully knitted sweaters, and they will deliver uh, towards the end of November. So hop on it early, obviously. You know, no one wants to wait till the last minute. You know, everyone does that every year, you know, including me. Uh, for years, I would be invited to an ugly sweater party and I would wait up until like the weekend before then I would go and try to find an ugly sweater that would be good but not overdone not not one that you'd see a million times and uh, you know I could just never find one so I went online and I bought an ugly sweater like a year out one time I bought it like literally the month after Christmas and uh, I just sat on it until the next Christmas party but I've been wearing that same gremlins sweater for probably like five years I cannot wait to grab one of these T fully knitted sweaters. So hop on over again, turnerdairy.net and grab one yourself. A um, couple other things I wanted to talk about today. So I have been, uh, you know, I've been, I've been deep diving into the horror movies, but I took a little hiatus from the horror movies. I know, I know I'm, I'm a piece of shit, but I binged watched Cobra Kai and I got to say, I loved every second of it. It is super corny. You know, it's very, very corny. It has a very, very, you know, I don't know how to describe it. You know, I don't know what, I didn't expect nothing crazy from it. You know, the Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio, what more could you want than the Karate Kid? You know, it was a, it was one of my favorites growing up. Mr. Miyagi's up in there. Like, come on. And uh, I hear about Cobra Kai. So they say, you know, they're making a new show with uh, Johnny Lawrence, the bad guy in, in The Karate Kid, and you got Daniel LaRusso, the good guy, Ralph Macchio. And uh, I heard that they were making this show a few, like a couple years ago, maybe. And I was like, you know, I'll, I'll pass on it. I'll pass on that. And uh, it finally hit Netflix, and I binge watched it both seasons. And Honestly, I loved every second of it. So if you're looking for something to watch and uh, you've been scrolling past Cobra Kai like I did for the first like month that it's on there, I'm just here to tell you it's pretty damn good. If you like, you know, martial arts stuff, if you like the Karate Kid, you know, there's a lot of callbacks from the original. It got the original, you know, it got the original asshole, Johnny Lawrence, who was the Cobra Kai star. And then uh, it got Daniel LaRusso. Come on. What else can you want? But uh, it's definitely worth watching. The ending that I, uh, the ending of season two was was good. You know, it was compelling. And uh, they got season three coming out in January. So I'm excited for that. But 
the reason that everyone is here this week. It is a very special week. Uh, this week, I'm sitting down with Zach Pishney. Zach Pishney is the he's a three time guest on the podcast. He's the first person that's ever been on here three times, and uh, I'm I'm excited about it because you know Zach was my first guest on here for episode one, and Zach was my 50th guest on here for episode 50 and now we're on episode 139 almost a whole you know 100 episodes past which is you know almost two years and uh me and zach you know pick right up pick pick right up where we left off the first episode we talk about him getting into the band like moths to flames i'm sorry i didn't mention that at first he's the guitarist in like moths to flames if you don't know who they are they are a very popular band you know heavy uh and they've been doing it for a minute but zach and you know me and my friends used to go and watch this band or we used to go and watch like moths to flames and uh Zach is now a member of the band and you know he's the only person that I know who grew up in a band who like you know he he's younger than me I watched him in his first local band that he ever played in I went to their first show ever and uh you know I just I watched this dude turn into a rock star in front of my eyes and uh I could not be more proud of him so the first episode was about how he got into the band the second episode that he was on episode 50 was kind of about you know his first experience touring with them and like working on the record that they that they were putting out and this episode is a little bit more special for me because Zach, you know, Zach got to sign a record deal and uh, Zach is, uh, you know, he's one of the, he's one of the official dudes now, you know, Wikipedia, like Monster Flames, you see Zach Pishney in there and it's crazy. It's crazy that you could walk into a Best Buy and buy a CD uh, with someone that, uh, you know, you watch grow up. Um, But so tomorrow, uh, October 30th, No Eternity in Gold. Like Moss to Flames, new album is dropping. And uh, this week, Zach and I sit down and we talk all about the process of writing a record, all about the process of getting a record contract, all about the process of recording a a record, and kind of like the steps that it took. And uh, I thought it was a really, really great episode. You know, we talk about how, you know, I I was always kind of curious on how someone writes a song, you know, like... I, I didn't know like what came first. Does, does the music come first and then someone writes to the music or does, you know, someone have lyrics and they have to like manipulate it to fit to the song? You know, we talk about stuff like that. We talk about, you know, what it was like going into a studio and living at a studio for a month and writing a record and, and how that manifests and how that ends up like, you know, coming out and being an official record. And I thought it was awesome to hear about. And we talk, we obviously we talk about COVID because COVID threw a wrench in everything as usual with everyone's stuff. And uh, I just thought it was a great, a really, really great episode. So what I would like you to do, if, uh, you know, if, if heavy music ain't your thing, you don't have to listen to the record, but, you know, try it out. They are really, really great. Like Moss to Flames, a great band. Uh, Zach kills it. The rest of the dudes in that band kill it. Uh, I got to listen to the the album. You know, I, I got a little preview. No big deal. And uh, it is fantastic. No Eternity in Gold. You could find it on Apple Music. You could find it on Spotify. You could find it everywhere. But if you go to unfd.com, you could find packages where you could order vinyl, you could order t-shirts, you could order CDs, you can order all this shit. And uh, tonight, they are doing a live stream of uh the album no eternity in gold on twitch um so you could hop over to their instagram at lmtf like moss to flames uh type in either of them and you will see all the information on there you will see what you could do where you could find it there's a link tree in their bio that you could click on everything it'll take you wherever you need to go and uh me and zach are also working on you know, we're also working on a little giveaway. Zach got some, you know, some some little uh, knickknacks here and there from uh, his his experience on tour. He got a vinyl, or he got a, uh, I, I said a vinyl, but yeah, I guess it's called a vinyl. But he got a little uh, a record that he's going to give away. He got some picks. He got a uh, backstage pass, uh, not a current one, obviously one that's been used. And he got a set list. But uh, we're going to do that. We're going to give away a brand new CD, and I strongly urge you guys to try out. 
uh, not try out, but just, you know, listen to No Eternity in Gold. That's their new album. It's dropping tomorrow. You could hop on Spotify or Apple Music right now and hit the save download or whatever, or, you know, like not save it, but like kind of like just hit it now and it'll automatically update for you. But uh, I'm excited for him. I really am. It's motivational for me to see someone like this, you know, that you grow up with, you know, just absolutely kill it. Like sometimes I go on my Spotify and let, like the Like Moss the Flames band is like on their page and, and like it comes up on a shuffle and you're just like, holy shit, there's Zach right there. And it's like, wow, like that's an incredible thing. So without further ado, Episode 139 of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with Zach Pishney from Like Moths to Flames. I gotta use the telephone. Hello? I'll call you right back, podcast. That's all right. I completely understand. Um, but, uh, so you are the first person that's ever been on here three times. Uh, you've been on here episode one. You've been on here episode 50. And now you'll be episode 139. So almost 100 since you've been on. Yeah, it's been wild. I looked up the dates. Uh, the first date you were on here was January 18th, 2018. So that was like almost three years ago. Yeah. And then I've been doing this for a minute, I guess. And then December 28th, 2018 was the 50th episode. So, I mean, today's what? The 25th of 2020? So, yeah, it's been a fucking long time. Uh, and I feel like that there's a lot of things that are happening and, uh, you got a lot of stuff that's happening in your life and I feel like that it was warranted. There's a new album coming out and I feel like it's a good chance to promote, even though you guys have a fucking bigger following than I do. Uh, this will help, I guess, maybe. No, nah, dude, it's always cool to come on and talk about shit, talk about what the band's been up to, what I've been doing, catch up with you. Uh, yeah, it's good to yeah, see dude, you. Good to see you too, man. I haven't seen you in a while. Everything's weird with the with the pandemic shit obviously yeah not a good time in the world but what can you do before we get into it i do an opening segment i guess it's a special one because uh we're having uh a different type of what's in the cup so what's in your cup what's in my cup we are drinking mimosas today (laughs) baby yeah, early Saturday recording and and uh, mimosas, and uh, I don't really ever. I don't know if I've ever really had a mimosa. I don't know if I've ever gotten one. Just makes me think of going out with my homies, getting brunch, you know, and just getting wasted, or it's going out good. with my girl and getting mimosas and having to piss all day afterwards. It's fun. It's pretty good. I uh, I've only had like bad experiences with champagne. Like every time I would drink champagne, it would just like give me a, a terrible migraine. See, but, I feel like the only booze that does that for me is like if I drink like an entire bottle of wine, I'll have like a crazy wine headache. But yeah. like champagne, I think like I don't know. I typically don't like kill an entire bottle to myself. Usually, it's something you're celebrating with people, so you'll just pass it around or whatever. So the last time I, uh, I think whenever I turned maybe twenty one or twenty two. Uh, my birthday was the same day of a Kenny Chesney concert. <laughs> so we went down there and I was like, oh yeah, it's my fucking birthday. You know, Biggie Small says sip champagne when we thirsty. Yeah. So I was like, I'm getting champagne. So I got a bottle of champagne and I drank probably like three quarters of the bottle. And I it was probably like two hours we were down there just roasting in the sun. <laughs> and I had the worst headache I've ever had in my life. I don't know if Maddie picked me up. Uh, he might have, but I was like, dude, I need to get home. And I just went home and slept for the rest of the day. Dude, I don't blame you. I feel like in that specific scenario, whenever you're drinking like sugary alcohol, you're out in the fucking sun. God forbid you're at a fucking Kenny Chesney concert. It, it probably <laughs> trashed Heinz Field at that point. It was. It uh, was a mess. Dude, I feel like that sun beating down on you, it's just going to fucking just make it a little bit worse. Like, I don't know. I definitely feel like, dude, it's like being getting drunk at Warp Tour whenever you're out there. Uh. Like, Oh my god! Like that sun starts hitting you, and it's just like, oh my god, your stomach starts getting weird. Yeah, and then it's like, I do. I'd go home and sleep too if I were you. I, Plus, like that champagne was probably 
dry as fuck too. And I'm sure I didn't. Yeah, it was super cheap. Whatnot. Super cheap, and I don't think we ate anything. I might have. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what was going on. But um, whenever you know, like whenever uh, I was like thinking about uh, what, like like I've been thinking about Warp Tour um, just because of like some of the music. Like I was, I've been listening to. Uh, all's well that ends well for like the last two weeks oh, shit. and it yeah, just yeah. like keeps going through and I, it makes me think of warp tour and warp tour was always just so fucked up because of like how hot it was and it's like you had a migraine anyway because of just the heat it's like no one's drinking water there because they want fucking eight dollars for a bottle and it's like oh yeah we'll give you a free monster and it's like <laughs> it's like that's not that's not helping you any better um, plus I don't think I've ever drank monster back then. So it was like, it nah, was, I'll take it cause terrible. it's free and it's cold and you get to sit in that little AC truck yeah. for a couple of minutes until they kick you out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, okay. So you wrote down like a little timeline and I'm glad you did that because you know, it'll definitely help with what we talked about. So episode one, uh, of the podcast for people that haven't listened to it yet is like, so I've known you since probably probably what since you were in like seventh grade maybe yeah so like probably that would be like 2007 i'd say yeah so like 13 years yeah. which is pretty fucking crazy to think about and uh the first episode we talked about how you know it like we used to like go to different concerts and like we used to go fucking see like Mosta flames different places and how you kind of just got in the band and it was just like weird because you know i i feel like that I feel like that I grew up in the music scene, but I was never in a band or anything. It's just all of you guys were, and I just was always there. And uh, it was, I mean, you're the only one that like made it, <laughs> that like made it into like a big band. And it's wild to think about that. That was the first episode. Second episode was whenever you had your roots in there and whenever you guys were like, you know, that was the Dark Divine era, right? Yeah, yeah. We had just finished our headliner for that record cycle, and then we talked afterwards. Because I think, yeah, you guys came out to that show. The whole crew did. Yeah. And then I think, like, I oh, came Oh, yeah, home. you were wearing yeah, that Penguins I, jersey. Yeah, because I came home maybe, like, two weeks after that pitch show, and then we linked up not long after. Yeah, so, like, for people that want to listen to the beginning of all this, listen to episode one. I apologize for how terrible it sounds. Uh, that was my first one. And then episode 50 probably sounded a little bit better, but you can kind of get an idea of where we were. So let's pick up where we left off after that Dark Divine tour. And, I mean, like, what is... First of all, I was thinking about this today, okay? So I want to know, in like, from the beginning, like, how do you write a song like like what comes first do the lyrics comes first or does the music come first because you play guitar and i need to know how that was because i was listening i was watching all the music videos listening to the new singles that you have out and i just don't understand it like i don't understand how a song is written because you know like like what's the process of it i mean it's it's totally different for everyone i'm sure like in our case like it pretty much starts with like me or jerry jeremy our other guitar player yeah uh, we usually will come up with a song idea or whatever. Like, I don't know, dude, for me personally, like I'll either just like be going about my day and I'll just get something in my head. Like, dude, I'm weird. I always have something going through my mind 24 yeah. seven. And, uh, sometimes a lot of it's music, whether it's a song I'm just jamming in my head that I know, or if it's just, I'm just like humming riffs in my head or something. So sometimes that'll kind of spark the creative flow for that. And I'll get an idea. And if it's that case, like, dude, there's been times I'm at work or something or just like out somewhere or driving and I have this idea for a song I'm like oh that that's that's groovy that fucks like I'll pull out my fucking uh my audio recording on my phone and just like kind of beatbox into my phone just hum a riff like dun 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 and just do whatever you know just to like get that idea out yeah. so I could go back to it later other times it comes naturally like I'll just be sitting at my like home demoing area like I have a little studio and everything with my computer so I'll just be jamming through my computer, uh, playing guitar, and sometimes a riff will just come naturally to me. I'll just be fucking around, playing with it, and then as I'm doing that, I'll find something I really like, and I'll just keep playing it until it starts to kind of like... The more I play it, once I like something, it kind of just starts to like remold. I'm like molding it a little bit because I'll start throwing in some like little accent notes or yeah. I'll throw in a different tail to the riff to like kind of complete it more. Yeah. And then from there, like, once I have something I like, like that first piece, if I have the time to actually straight up just start recording at my computer, I will, I'll just plug, like, I'm already plugged in, so I'll just figure out the tempo, the BPM, and then uh, 
just start laying it down like a scratch track of the guitar. Other times if I'm in a rush, I'll just set up my phone and film the riff real quick so I can just favorite it in my videos and then go back and look at it later to try and map out the BPM and all that. Yeah. But once I can actually start tracking it, like from there I'll get that I'll get that first riff or that first hook written and tracked on guitar. And then from there, like usually I already have like drums in mind for the most part, whenever I have something going through my head, like it's all kind of there together when I'm thinking it. Yeah. Uh, so what happens if like, let's say like Chris or someone else from the band, like writes lyrics and it's like, just has lyrics written down, but doesn't have any music behind the lyrics. That's what I was like really thinking about is like how, like, like if you have, it's almost like writing a poem or like, a, yeah. like, like it's, you're writing a poem and you have to like put it towards like this riff, like how, where's the crossover with that? Like if you have a bunch of different riffs and shit in your phone that you just have like back, like, like just backlogs yeah. of like mean ass shit. It's like, do you just like send it to like, like, do you just like send it to the rest of the band and like kind of piece together like lyrics that are there? Like, how does no, that work? That's not the process we take particularly. Um, Chris doesn't really like writing that way. Some, I think some bands do have lyrics. Just, I think some people always are writing lyrics yeah. uh, and then they'll write music to it or whatever. But like, we usually will start with music and kind of set the mood that way. Uh, okay. Cause he likes to kind of hear what we're hearing to give himself like a platform to like, jump into and get creative yeah because like the song will set the vibe for him like i guess that makes sense each song you know like if it's do, heavy as fuck yeah, it's not it's gonna be like something very very like you know light and like you know yeah yeah i, like, I get it i guess that makes more sense so like he likes to have a mood to listen to to figure out where he wants to write or to see if it makes him like feel something to take him somewhere to write about you know that's a good way to think about that but yeah like so like lyrics are usually the last piece of the puzzle when it comes to writing for us. But like, as for like writing the riffs and stuff, like sometimes I'll end up just writing. like the other day I wrote this new riff and I didn't have time to actually start tracking it. So I just filmed it on my phone. I was pretty stoked on it. So I just sent it to Aaron and Chris and the dudes. And, uh, it was just like, yeah, this is a hype riff. I'm stoked on it. What do y'all think? And you know, they're like, Oh yeah, this is fucking dope. Like, it's like, all right, cool. I'll just backlog it for later. But wow. How much backlog shit do you have? Just like a crazy amount? Dude, probably so much. I'll never even like go back and look at Like there's been times <laughs> on tour I'll be like doing that same thing. Like, oh, I got a riff idea. Riff it out and then just never look at it again. <laughs> yeah. But like I feel like subconsciously though, I do remember some of those different riffs because like the some things ones. just stick. Yeah. Some things just stick and I'll like, I have things I never even filmed that I just remember I played. I'm like, damn, that is a cool thing. I need to do something with it. So it's Jeez. nice to have that all that shit left over but yeah 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 it's like like i have a i have a notebook that i'll just like write jokes and shit on and Mm -hmm. like bits and like there's stuff that like i wrote probably like three or four years ago that i'll never look at again but it's like i'll go through randomly and just like see it and you know you can revisit it and like try to make something out of it yeah dude um so like i said so 2018 the end of 2018 was like after the dark divine tour and then like what was the response to that album I, feel I like know it was, it was mixed. Yeah, I was just gonna say mixed reviews for sure. It, it's I feel like it kind of, I feel like it made the old school fans maybe take a step back. Yeah, because a little bit because it wasn't just like there was some heavy heaviness. Raw shit. Yeah, it wasn't just it wasn't super aggressive. Yeah. Like there were some heavy aspects to it because you know heavy is always subjective. How you hear music is subjective from yeah. what I think is this to what you think is that. Absolutely. So that's one thing, but like. I feel, yeah, I feel like the average, like, fan of the band probably took a step back a little bit just because it wasn't the straight-up aggressiveness that they're used to from the band. But at the same at the same time, I feel like... It brought new listeners in. Yeah, it brought new listeners in. Or, like, it brought, like, some people that liked maybe the singing from the band or, like, like I don't know, every song or every album... Has different shit. Every some has songs, different shit, but... Some songs are, like, crazy heavy, and then, like, you got some of the, like, singing in there. Yeah. And... and there's people that like both ends of it. Like I love both ends. I love the super heavy shit and I love like the singing. And, uh, I know that there's some people that pick one or the other, but it's like, what is your outlook? Someone who like, you know, had their roots in the band because like, obviously when you first started during episode one, it's like you were just, you were kind of just getting felt out by the band, right? You weren't necessarily like a hundred percent like grounded in there where you're At like that a, point I was in, I was just in, okay, but like so- when we were making dark divine though, I <clears throat> I was still like trial and error. You know what I mean? Like I was 
in the camp, but yeah. I wasn't like official with them. Yeah. So it's so, like, like it was, I didn't get to like, I couldn't just put my foot down and say what I really thought, or I couldn't steer something this way if I wanted to. I kind of just was at the position where it's like, I just had to roll with that. Yeah. You're the low and, guy in the totem yeah, pole. So ex- it's like, exactly. you had to work your way up to it. Now, after that, after like you being in there and like having like your roots in there and like kind of being like a, like unofficial, like, like, like part of the, the full squad, it's like, what what's your feeling of like you know the negative because obviously the the greats are like the highs are high but the lows are so low i'm sure like there's people that are like this is fucking garbage like i know that not even just like you but it's like every band is going to have people that are like this is fucking trash anyone who doesn't anyone who like is used to the old shit that like hasn't that that isn't like used to the new style. It's like, what's your feeling behind like you know the negative of things? Like, how do you take that and how do you like not let that like affect your mental? I mean, I really just take it with a grain of salt. At the end of the day, whenever you do see negative shit like that, it's usually just a fucking comment on the internet, which yeah. is a screen. So it's well, like, some people that could eat at some people for a long time. I mean, yeah, it like I think like earlier on maybe it made me more worried, but like. I feel like you just kind of get, I don't know, you get thicker skin with it. And it's just like, yeah. I don't care what some well, that's douchebag good. internet troll thinks. It's like, all right, let me hear you write a song. That's a good point. Like, let me, all right. like. Well, let- I was curious about it because it's like, you know, like in and, and, and a band as a whole, it's like, I know that if like, you know, something is received negatively, you know, whether it be like a podcast or something like that, if it's received negatively, it might like kind of make you like reevaluate reevaluate what you're doing. Oh, for sure. And not I mean, necessarily in a positive way, but like what was like the overall feeling of like, you know, that, that I album? feel like because of that, like I think it was a blessing <clears throat> and a curse because it made some fans take a step back. I don't think we got as much promotion or marketing or like tours off it. Cause it didn't do as well. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like it helped the band grow because it gave us a chance to work with a new producer because that was the first time they had gone to a new producer. Yeah. Uh, cause they did their first three records with the same dude. So I feel like that was growth for them. Uh, I feel like it was growth just for the band doing different types of music, like different types of sounds, I guess, within the band. Like it still sounds like Moths at its core. Yeah. But like that album just had a lot of different atmosphere and we experimented with more like sample pads and just different, uh, I guess like more modern new age shit that other people were doing. We tried different song structures with like doing some slow verses. So I think it like, although it might not have been well reciprocated in the grand scheme of things with like fans in general. Yeah. I feel like it definitely brought new people on board, which helped. I think the fans that didn't like that record, they saw the old records to jam and that doesn't mean that they're not going to love our new record. Yeah, so it's, it's like, they're still, they're still hooked, but you know, just got to get them back in the boat. Absolutely. But if it's like, there's people that if you have fans that are, you know, people that are like so shallow to the point where they're just like, Oh, that's it. I'm done listening to it. It's like, you don't want those fucking people anyway. Oh yeah, exactly. But, uh, so after that, you know, obviously like you're in the band and you guys are like, what's the process after you get off that tour? It's like, you guys, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, do you wash, you know, the whole dark divine like era away immediately and like try to just start from scratch? Uh, it's not, like, not I mean, even that, not even just you, but like a band in general, it's like, I like, you know how, um, uh, the only way I could equate it is like, you know, comedians will talk about how they'll tour their shit for like a year. And once they're done with that tour, they just th- throw that away and they, they kind of just get a fresh mindset to like write something. So it's like, how does like that experience with that album, like kind of like build you up to like, like what was the approach to the new album? <clears throat> well, I guess just like kind of getting more comfortable with just like we wanted to take uh kind of direction in like more of our own hands so i guess just being more proud with like just writing 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 so yeah. i think it just took like us and like i guess especially it was just like a weird time because like i was in i was a new guitarist so yeah i you know now was my chance like all right i'm in like now i need to start writing you know uh jeremy was a big help in getting me set up with like my home studio and like uh showing me how to operate like my interface and and set up my DAWs and everything and get different plugins, et cetera. So like having him teach me that and how to program drums, all that, that really helped jumpstart me specifically to being just able to do it. Cause I could write, but I would never, I, it, you can't show someone a song. You just have 
phone videos of. You That's know, a good like, point. I, I need to be able to go in and program drums and then add this little effect so I can get the be full professional. effect. Yeah, so they can say, oh, this is a cool song, Zach. Like, let's go track it. Like, let's go use it for the album. Now, for you to be like a new guitarist in there, like, did you feel like some sort of like heavy, heavy burden that like you got to like, you know, prove yourself and like, you know, do that? I wouldn't look at it as a burden, but it was definitely like a point a to challenge. prove myself. Yeah, it was just kind of like put in the work, like go big or go home. Like someone's got to fucking fill the shoes and yeah. I'm in the shoes right now. And so That's we got to awesome. do it. Gives me chills right now <laughs> to think about that. But like, I feel like going back to like some like the dark divine, like negative aspects. Like I feel like sometimes like, like you said, comedians will have a bad tour, this or that. Like I, f- I think sometimes bands are gonna have bad record cycles. Absolutely, and, and you're just you just kind of have to take it gracefully. You can't throw a big pity party about it. You can't like just be complaining about it or you know crying about or it. Or let online. that affect your life yeah, in you can't, a certain you just way. Got to kind of just keep your your game face on, just keep rolling with it. And it's like we still like that record. We're still proud of it. It yeah. brought different elements to the band that. We can we we still utilize now. We learn things from doing that record that we learned we can incorporate with our band. Like absolutely, and you can hear that on the new record and even the EP we did. So make no mistake. Like whenever I ask you about like the negative of of that record, like I don't mean to just like <clears throat> excuse me. I don't mean to just like bring it up with you. I'm just talking about mainly as like you know your experience overall. Because oh, like yeah. if anyone was a band, like if 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 you were a different person in a different band, I would ask the same questions because like, you know, I like if I get a negative review of the podcast or something like that, it it's like it it, it kind of like eats at me a little bit because like I'm my own biggest critic a hundred percent. And I know that that's like the same way with all you guys, any sort of like art that you are creating, you're definitely the biggest critic if you're like passionate about it. So it's like, that's why I wanted to like know how you guys like dealt with all that. And it's interesting to me because like, you're obviously like thriving, like you guys are fucking killing it. And it's like, I know, I remember you telling me that like there was mixed reviews on it. And I just wanted to know like that, that sort of like aspect of it, like how you take that and use that as like a constructive criticism and how you like kind of, because it's weird because like a podcast for me is like every week I do something different with a different person. It's all going to feel different, but for a band, it's like you're creating a whole project and it's interesting to me, like the thought process of like the approach to it all. But, uh, that's it's 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 sick to like to like hear how that goes through. Yeah, I mean, we just kind of use it as fuel for the fire. Like, oh, I love that fuel. That's a good way to. I mean, that's exactly. A good so it's like, and and it's just the approach, and it's just your perspective. Like, it's everything's a matter of shifting perspective. Like, yeah, you can. Like, there's been times like, I don't. We don't always like to go through YouTube comments, but sometimes I will just to like sift through and to see what people are saying because that's a good way to gauge how yeah, what yeah. people think. So like, absolutely. Sometimes like you see some great comments, and sometimes there is that one that's like it eats at you a little bit. But then you wonder, it's like, hmm, all right, wh- like what are they saying about the song or like this? You know, and sometimes sometimes those comments like sometimes there are some that aren't necessarily negative. They yeah. just give like some kind of oh, I wish they would have kept this part going instead of dropping into a chorus so soon and so it makes for me you think. that gives me food for thought to be like hmm all right well if a lot of people are saying this about this song maybe next time i write something in this vein i should maybe try a different approach with the structure so it can help like with i guess just future stuff just to see what what's working or not what's it's interesting how you know you could get you know a hundred and some you know hundreds of comments that are positive positive. But if you have that one negative one, that's the one that you notice because it's like, it's great to read all the great comments, but they, they all turn into, you know, just one big praise, but it's like that one negative thing, it cuts. And it's like, uh, it's interesting because like I said, even with the podcast shit, it's like, that's the only way I could equate, you know, with what you guys do to what I do, because like, I've never been in a band or anything. Like, I don't know that whole like process and know what it's like, but, uh, I try to learn, I mean, like with anyone I have on here, I just try to learn about your life and how you guys kind of like, you know, approach things because I just, I'm new to all this shit as well. And it's like, I I want to like learn how different people process things and like work it into my own mentality. But uh, I think it's dope. Um, So after the Dark Divine shit, it's, it, you sent me this timeline, and it said writing sessions in 2009 uh, in Georgia. So whenever you're talking about this, it's like, you know, like, when was that in Georgia? 
Uh, well, our other guitar player, Jeremy, he currently lives in Georgia. Yeah. That's actually where he's from. <clears throat> so he's back. He's been back there for a couple years, but he has like a little studio set up there and we had like, we wanted to get together and right, because we all live remote from each other. It, like, it's not like, it's cool to like sit down by myself and write Cause I get my own juices flowing and same for him and everyone else. But like sometimes you need to be in a room with someone else to bounce ideas back yeah. or like, especially, I think at that point we re- we really needed to just because we were trying to like hone in what we wanted to do sound wise. So it made sense for like us to get together. So we had some time off after that dark divine tour and the holidays and whatnot. So I think it was like beginning of February, 2019. Uh, I just flew down to Atlanta, hung out at his place for a week. We just, you know, got stoned, drank some beers, wrote music, got food, just chilled out. Yeah. Skaggs was living down there at the time too. He came through for a day and we ah, all chilled. That's dope. But yeah, dude, it was a good time. So we literally just like for hours, like eight plus hours a day would just honestly dude, probably close to 10 or 12 hours. Some days we'd just be sitting in, in his room, this like shed outside. He turned into a studio and we were just sitting in there, just writing, just like busting out shit. It was cool because whenever we first got together, he had maybe like four demos that he liked and wanted to use. I probably had like four of my own and we were just going to like re-record them, add shit. We we're going to work on the drums together and like, yeah. you know, just collab more on the individual ones. But when we first got there, we were like, Oh, let's just jam some ideas. And like, and I started, we just started messing around for a while and I started playing this one riff and he's like, Oh yo, that's sick. Let me track that. And then he tracked it. And then I passed him the guitar and he's like, I have an idea for this little seasoning. And that, yeah, exactly. And then he had the next part. And then I was like, Oh dude, if we're going this route, I have this one riff that I could pull up from, I wrote two months ago, let's throw this as the verse. And then literally that song turned into All It You Lost, which was the first single from our EP. So dude, that song just came about so organically. Like within the first two hours I was in Atlanta with him, that song started coming to life. So if you guys are there writing and you guys are tracking, you know, different, I don't know, you, I guess you don't call them songs at that point. Demos. Demos. Yeah. If you guys are tracking different demos after you do that and you come up with these demos, like, is that is that what you like send to the rest of the band and you're like like what do you think about this and that's where like the lyrics and shit come in lyrics are way later still yeah like we will like we ended up making uh we have dropbox and stuff we have dropbox accounts so we ended up just making like a, a shared one yeah like a moths demos 2020 or whatever or i guess 2019 at that point yeah and then uh we would just put them in there so we had about like eight demos or so from that batch and then yeah we just sent it to the group and everyone just listened and then from there, like once we actually have that stuff solidified, like we'll pick which ones were the favorites. And then sometimes songs get set on the back burner, but like, so actually from that batch of songs, we had like eight or nine, I think three of them went onto the EP that we did later that year. Mm -hmm. And then I think at least three more of those songs ended up on no eternity and gold, which is cool. Oh wow. From like back then. Yeah. Like we, we kept, re, we kept redoing them and revamping them and just like, cause we had months and months to keep going that we ended up just working on these songs more. Yeah. So, so how many tracks ended up being on that project? Uh, the, which project? The one that you guys were writing for then. Didn't you release the EP later? Oh yeah. yeah. We released an EP called where the light refuses to go. Yeah. Uh, November, 2019. We only did three songs for it. We just wanted to just kind of put something fresh out just to give us like i guess just like a little like courtesy gap between yeah both our divine and the new full length just because like we're at a weird time because we had left rise records yeah and uh we were free agents for a little bit and then we ended up signing with unfd in the summer uh so since we already had that we were already working on those songs like once we had those songs like those three picked out out of that first batch from that Georgia writing session. We took them to a friend of ours in Columbus. Uh, he has a studio there. His name's Nick Ingram. He works at Capitol house studio. It's his own studio. It's a cool place. Uh, yeah, we went there to start tracking them and we ended up, I think that was in the, uh, that was in the same time frame. We were talking to UNFD signing with them. So we ended up talking with them. We're like, Hey, can we release an EP before we do a full length? We yeah. just, we didn't want to, dive into the full length yet yeah, so for we ended sure. up just doing that we just wanted to do a quick little banger three songs just 
that's what we did. And it was cool because they're on board with it. It was nice that they heard our idea and they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. We can do that first. So, now, you said that you guys are free agents. It's like at that point in time, do you guys like like seek out different labels that you that you are interested in? Or is it like people that are like seeking you out? I feel like it's more so people were seeking us out. Yeah, because you, you had people, a big name yeah. already. So people obviously know that like you, you guys have credibility and you guys have a you know, a history in the music scene. So it's like, I would assume people would, you know, want to pick you guys up. Yeah. From what, from what I understand, it seems like people were more so like reaching out to our manager and then he would, you know, filter out the That's sick, messages though. back to us saying like who was interested or whatever. Cause there's a couple of different options flying around in our emails and whatnot. But yeah, it was, it was really cool, cool experience because like for me personally, Whenever I joined, they were already with Rise. Like whenever I did my first tour with them, they were renewing their contract to do Dark Divine. Yeah. So like I wasn't a part of that technically. Like I was there, but I'd never signed a contract for Rise or anything. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Like, it was for me, dude. It was super fucking rewarding to like actually be have in your name the band on and and have that contract come in from unfd and be like damn i fucking signed a record contract yeah dude that's what i mean like that's where this all fuck that's why i I chose to like try to talk to you the first time because it's like i don't know anyone else that like you know has like lived their lives like wanting like like submersing themselves in music like ever since i can remember you you had a fucking guitar in your hand (laughs) just ripping and it's like it it gives me chills whenever i think about it and i use you as like a reference because it's like it's so like rewarding even for like friends that are not you. I can't even imagine how you feel because like when me and Brian talk about you and like, you know, like anyone else, it's just like, it's, it's so awesome to see that it's a possibility. It's like, it's like you made it into something that you wanted to make it into. And like signing that would be fucking crazy. Oh yeah, dude. It was, it was wild. But I think the strange, well, the strangest part about it is just, you know, 2019, 2020, Literally was able to sign the contract on my fucking phone. <laughs> I know it's wild. They sent it in digital through some like weird <laughs> app or something. I forget what it was, but like, yeah, we all were able just to like sign it on our phones and like re-upload it to that server or something weird like that. But hey, signature is a signature, baby. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's awesome. So after you like like the process of you guys writing in Georgia and you guys creating that like that uh, that three that three song EP, it's like. Like during that time, are you guys like still constantly, you know, writing? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Like that's kind of something that never stops, really. Like yeah. sometimes I just get the the itch to write, you know, or I'll just be jamming at home and something naturally just comes about. I'm like, all right, that's a sick riff. I have to do something with it. And then you know, whether it just depends on how I feel. Sometimes, like once I get that first riff, sometimes it's real easy for me just to snowball and just make that song come to life within two days or a day or something granted granted it's not completely done but it's still like the skeleton of a song yeah, it still needs that you could you build know, from it'll be yeah. easy to build from that rather than you know nothing mm-hmm. now in that downtime of you guys releasing in november it's like are you guys consciously like you know we're working on this full length this is just a snack that we're putting out oh yeah we were totally aware of what was going on like okay. we had already had plans to record in 2020 we were just kind of we were still figuring out. Well, I guess at that point, once the EP was out, we already knew that we were going to go work with the dudes we worked with. Yeah. Um, now, do you have like a, a, a timeline of like, you know, I don't know how it is with like record contracts and shit, but do they like have you a certain timeline that you have to like have something done and ready to be? Like, did you have an idea of when you wanted this album to come out? Well, initially, I think it, it's kind of hard to say because I don't have like official word on it, but just from what I gathered just through emails and how like we had a a nice co-headlining tour planned for uh, July and August this year that never got to happen because of COVID. Yeah. But I, I feel like the plan initially was, cause we recorded no eternity in gold January, 2020 through February. And I think our goal was to try and have it ready by that tour yeah. or at least some singles to drop. So it probably would have been here a few months earlier. Yeah, but because of all this bullshit. Yeah, it just made more sense to push it back and whatnot. And that just makes like, sense. And because of COVID happening, like we ended up like taking a little bit longer to like give mix notes on like our final mixes and masters. So like, so we knew the tours were going to be shot. So like, yeah, there's we no ended rush. Up, we ended up kind of like slowing down a little bit and like, and I know at one point uh, because of COVID. 
the dudes that were working on our record, they weren't able to go into the studio for yeah. a while, and they had the hard drive with our album on it there. So they had to like make a special trip to like be able to go get it so they could take it home to their home studios to finish working on it. Wow. So through a fucking wrench and everything. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't that big a deal, luckily, because I mean, like, we already knew we had. I'm talking about COVID. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A wrench thrown in everything. It's fucking insane. Now, before you guys were, uh, you know, writing uh, No Eternity in Gold, like, you you said you were on a tour with Plot? Yeah, yeah. We did that uh, right when we were starting uh, recording the EP before we knew it was going to be the EP. (laughs) Now, how long was that tour? It was probably like. Uh, five weeks or so. I think it was, it started like March 31st and probably ended like May 1st or something like that. Yeah. I think I got home May 1st, maybe. And where all do you guys, do you guys go? Just, it was just, just uh, a full U S tour. Yeah. All around. Yeah. Now it, it, like whenever you guys, like, I don't know, you probably don't know is in depth, but it's like, how do you guys like figure out where you are going to go? Or is that just all the manager like coming up with places? We have a booking agent that takes care of all that stuff. I think what they do is they get a tentative route because I feel like if it usually like the start and end date, of the tour i think will kind of be up to the headliner yeah so like i think plots based out of michigan so i think we started in michigan and i think we ended in michigan too or maybe ended it somewhere near michigan yeah but yeah like whenever we tour we like to start i guess it depends but like sometimes we like to try and end in columbus or yeah or start why not, close right? to columbus you know so that way it's like all right we can start our tour with a four hour drive to or three hour drive to pit or something. Yeah, or we why could, would you end it in Oregon whenever yeah, you got to yeah. go back anyway? It's like Michael Scott with the fun run and then five K away. Yeah, exactly. It's like, why wouldn't you make it a circle? <laughs> like that happens whenever you're not the headliner and you have yeah. to fucking start a tour in California and then end in Texas or some weird shit like that. That's fun. <laughs> now is it, it now for that tour? Are you guys just driving to all these places? Yeah. Yeah. We're always just have our van and trailer. Now, uh, like, I, I mean, I know that there's like positives and negatives of touring, but like you love it, I assume. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I fucking miss it so bad right now. It, it's like, I feel like it, uh, it gotta be insane to just be able to go to all these different places and to be like, uh, obviously you know what it's like to be like one of the grunts where it's like, you know, eyes is just gets a show somewhere and like you guys and people might not know who you are mm-hmm. and you're just hoping that people could vibe with the music you're putting out. But it's like Moss is like, it's well known. So it's like to go places, you got fans in all these different places. It's probably like such a powerful feeling to be able to go to a random ass place and like have people like wearing your fucking merch, even though that's a, that's taboo to wear the (laughs) the merch or the band you're going to see. But it's like, it got to be awesome to be able to experience that. Yeah, dude, I I agree. It, It is fun to wake up in a new city every day, drive to a new city every day and just like, I don't know. Like you said, I put in grunt work with my local bands and shit back in the day. So it is nice kind of like, I don't want to say we're guaranteed a good show, but it's like, we're guaranteed a nice crowd at least Yeah. when we tour with great bands too. So like a lot of the bands we're touring with pull their weight and whatnot. So it's great to have everyone collectively having that that guaranteed good show, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously we have to make sure we put on the good show. Yeah. But. You gotta do, you gotta do good. You guys ever fuck up during a show? Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's but like, not like nothing too crazy. Like in the, like in the last couple of years, it's usually just like gear malfunction. Yeah. I think you like told I me mentioned. like your guitar wasn't working one time. Yeah. My pedal board like exploded. Oh uh, yeah. Shit. That was like it. not really exploded, but you know, just shat the bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to deal with it. Fuck yeah. it. Um, okay. So, you said uh, after the plot tour, you guys signed with UNFD, and it's like, you know, after that, you guys are just like, you know, hammering out this, hammering out No Eternity and Gold? Pretty much, like, like not like leisurely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It out. Just like, yeah, I you get know, it. like, yeah. But yeah. like, that's like the main focus of your work. Pretty much, yeah, because we didn't have any tours planned. We knew that we had studio coming up, and it was just like, we knew, I mean, at that point, we probably already had like 20 demos to sift through. So it's like we had material, but it's like, I just want to keep writing, writing more. And it's like, you come home from a tour and then you want to fucking just start writing more. Cause you get inspired from that. And you've been away, or at least for me, I don't really bring recording gear with me on tour. So I'm away from my rig for so long. I want to come back and just start riffing dude. And yeah. Just, putting you know. shit down that you were thinking of. Yeah. Cause I don't know. It's just like being around all that music and just creative people for, you know, five weeks. It kind of just gets you motivated, inspired. You get to see how other bands work and you get to see, their workflow and it's just like it's definitely uh 
I don't know. I guess motivating. Now, while you guys are uh, like, like, when does when does the title "No Eternity in Gold" come in? Like, when is that thought of? Like, how, like, is that before? Did you already know that was going to be that, or did that come later? That was later. Okay, uh, yeah, that's what I figured. I just didn't know if that was like something that like was yeah. built from or not. So, like, <clears throat> I don't mean to like speak for Chris, but. No, no, I get it. I get Whenever, it. Whenever, like, the, the way we work is, like, so we got to the studio and, like, had our demos picked and shit. Once we got a couple songs, like, good enough for him to, like, properly listen to, Yeah, he, uh, he would just take them and would just listen to them, vibe out, smoke, just write to them. And he, I think he likes to write with, like, take like the flow of the music or like the beat, like the rhythm of the music of the beats and like try and make syllables to it or something. Or yeah. like he has his own crazy unique way of like writing. For like sure. He, he does his own thing and he fucking kills it. Yeah. But so yeah, he just, we just give him his time to do whatever. And then he comes back, tracks his shit, you know, a day later we get to hear the song, you know, like the, with vocals on it now. Like, now, how long was it for you guys to like go to that recording session and record that album? Like through, uh, we were there from January 5th until February 8th. So just oh, like over a month. A month. Yeah. Wow. And we got to live at the studio too. Um, really? Yeah. It was, it was, it was badass, man. We recorded at, uh, think loud studios in York PA. They so had like a like, place for you guys to sleep in there. Yeah, it was dude. It was, they had like hotel style room is this was like, geez. All right. So backstory, do you know like that nineties band, uh, live? Yeah, lightning crashes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. They own the studio. Lightning they own crashes. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. They own the studio we recorded at. Thank wow. Cloud. We didn't work with them specifically, but like they own the building. Uh, it's like this big warehouse building. The top floor, the fourth floor is the studio. Yeah. And the other floors below to have different businesses in it or whatever. But they have their studio up top, and they have like a huge like living area. There's like a living room. There's wow. a kitchen on the one side. There's a kitchen on the studio side of the building. Uh, they have their own like personal like a studio that's like theirs. That's always locked. Like yeah. you, we had access to use it for certain days when we needed to, but like they had like our producers had to hit them up. And then uh, like there's a st- like a live room and then a tracking room that our producers got to utilize. We worked with two people. We worked with uh, Carson Slovak and Grant McFarland. Uh, they're part of Atrium Audio, but they had been renting out Think Loud's studio for like the last year and a half while they were getting their new studio, like Blueprints built for it and whatnot. Yeah. So it was cool to like, that was like a once in a lifetime thing for us. Cause like, yeah, that's we won't wild. be able to go back. I mean, like we could go back there, but chances are we'd probably go elsewhere, but like we want to, you know, work yeah. with probably Grant and Carson again. Great time working with them. Yeah. Uh, that's sick that there's like, I didn't understand that. Like if you guys like were just like in a hotel somewhere and you just traveled there, but that's cool that like you got to like just be there and yeah, like, be dude, in there. It was insane. All right. So like on the other side, like where the living side of the studio was, there was like a little hall, like two different hallways that like led to like hotel style rooms. Wow. So like there was five of them. So like each room had a bed, a TV, dress. It was literally like a hotel room, its own bathroom. And then there are still like common bathrooms throughout the studio itself. Yeah. So it would dude, it was like dude, I would just fucking wake up, make coffee, and like we'd usually start at like ten AM or something. So I'd wake up at like nine, chill out, maybe play some Nintendo Switch and then make coffee and then Carson would show up and it's like, Hey man, you want to smoke pot and then start our day? Yeah. <laughs> it was badass. Yeah. That's awesome. And you're like, man, that's so cool that you guys like do that. So it's like you guys record that all for a month and like, how long does it take for that to be like mastered? I know it varies with different people, I'm sure, <clears throat> but it's like, what, like how long did that process take for them to like master that out? Um, before so, you guys like get a, a, a finished version to like listen to. So the way they work is like, they kind of work as a team. So Carson takes care of like all the tracking and whatnot. Like he, he was working with us when we track guitars and tracked bass. Yeah. And then, um, he does, I think he does some of the mixing as he's doing it. Like he, he does things as we record. So it's not like, it's not like we just record a song and it's all raw. All right, next one. Like we'll, uh, okay. we'll track, we'll track a song or track a part and he'll start building it as there. we go. Yeah. Then he's like, all right, let's do the next part. And then we'll like do his adjustments, do whatever he's doing. Like they're insanely talented with what they do. Yeah, I bet. But so while he's doing that, Grant 
will be in the live room and he he's a drummer himself he used to drum for this or the apocalypse if you know that band yeah yeah um he used to drum for them and he also is great with like vocal production and whatnot so he worked with chris in the in the live room tracking vocals together and like working on melodies and doing all that sorts of stuff while we just kept you know banging out the music so it was cool so we would we would get together like we i guess we had to start like me and jay would go in start a couple of songs. Once we got like two songs done enough to the point where we could give it to Grant, he would take it onto his session in his live room. And then him and Chris would start working from there. So it's like, we give them two songs. They can start working. We work on two more songs. Yeah. They finish two songs and we just ah. like keep passing along. And it was just a real cool, like assembly line type deal. Like, which is how they had just two people to utilize to work with. Yeah. And it was nice too, because Grant being a drummer, he was able to really help hone in, drums for us and yeah that's and just like cool. get great tones and everything wow that's awesome that would be that would be a crazy experience for yeah, sure dude. so uh you know you guys record that and you guys are obviously like you know kind of mastering that like what is like what's what's like the next step in life like what were you guys doing after that because you said it was like february <clears throat> 2019 right yeah and, and or, no, no, February 2020 or 2020. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're in 2020. I forgot. <laughs> so if you guys are in February, it's like COVID obviously started March 23rd, Yeah. but like if there was no COVID, like what was, uh, when was that next tour supposedly supposed to pop off? Uh, I think it was supposed to start like July 10th or something like and that. Who was that with? I can't say. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, that just like, uh, I didn't know if it was like already like promoted before. No, we never got to even like announce it or promote or anything. Like, uh, it's something we still want to do in the future, potentially. We just got to see. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, if everything what can work out. But well, now you, you left me a, uh, you left me a uh, note that said a wage war tour. Oh, yeah. We did that. That's the one. That's the tour we did around the EP release. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. We did that. That was a wage war headliner. They uh, last summer they had just put out a new full length as well. Yeah, and uh, they that they were starting their touring cycle for that. So they had us as direct support, and then uh, our buddies in Dayseeker also played that, and uh, it was a great fucking tour, man. Now, now on like the day of a show, like do you guys pretty much keep? like the same track list for every show or is it like whatever you guys like wake up and like kind of like agree on like how we, does that work we usually keep the same set list going like uh we'll kind of like it depends how we build it because like our drummer will usually play to a click yeah and sometimes like we like to like try and like have some kind of like ambient sounds are just like weird like rumbles or like just atmosphere so it's happening easier whenever. to have a consistent yeah whenever like we stop a song like we we really tried to do it for that tour because like i actually went to our buddy nick's studio and like got together with him and like made like a a big uh like almost like a score like a, yeah yeah pretty much just like, like, like made, you just like took all the uh click tracks and all like the things and just like made like a big timeline of it on logic oh. and we just like made ambient sounds or like we made a an intro to the intro of a song you know what i mean like wow like you know how like i solemnly swear has that breakdown like da na 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 yeah so i like i took that riff and just like tracked it and we just added like kind of like rumbles and dub steps to it and like made it go into the song so like we like oh, teased wow. that breakdown made it sound like industrial so it'd be like dun 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 and then the song would actually kick Oh, wow. So we like went and tried to do some cool production like that. So like in that sense, like you kind of have to keep the same set list, but yeah. you know, uh, there's always trial and error. Sometimes like if we're not vibing with the song after a certain point, it is easy for us to be like, all right, we can cut this one and swap it with this one. And yeah. then we have all the click tracks just to like mix and match if we need like clip in and clip out whatever yeah. pieces you need. Yeah. We just have to make sure we do it prior to that show happening. So it's something you can't really do on the fly. Like if we want to cut something, like if we don't have time or, you know, like that's a little bit easier than adding something sometimes. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, no eternity in gold that comes out, uh, technically it'll be out tomorrow. Uh, cause this is going to come out Thursday. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're so in the future. Yeah. We're in the future. Oh. Uh, so tomorrow, <laughs> no eternity in gold comes out. Now, uh, I want to know where'd the name come from? Uh, it's a lyric in the last track of our album. Uh, the last track's called spiritual eclipse and the, uh, 
the last couple lines of the song says, uh, the intricate touch of death, spiteful and cold, there's no eternity in gold. Mm. Uh, and whenever, like, that last song, this fucking insane breakdown happens, and then, like, it repeats again, and when it repeats, Chris just screams, no eternity in gold. And when I first heard that when we were at the studio, I was like, oh my fucking God, dude, this rocks. Like, this is so fucking heavy. That's sick. And like, oh, dude, just made me want to like slam fucking what does that chairs mean against to you? a wall. What, what does, does it, it mean, mean to, to me? you? To me personally, it just means like, like how do you interpret that? It's kind of like another way of saying like nothing gold can stay. Like, yeah. you, you know, like shit's not all, like, you're not always going to be on top of things like the ebb and flow of life. Like things are going to get bad. You can't always like, I love that. But I mean, I think Chris has his own. Yeah, everyone got their own it, meanings. That's why I said, "Why do you interpret? How do you interpret you. it?" But because yeah, that's that's kind of what it is for me. Just like you kind of just got to go with it. Now, uh, wow, that's fucking dope. So uh, now, this I was looking. Uh, you know, we talked about not reading like YouTube comments and shit, but yeah. I was reading through like the the couple videos that you guys put out, and uh, dude, it seems like everyone is fucking stoked yeah 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 because it's I a little bit heavier too. it's a little bit heavier it's like it, like do you think that it's 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 a little bit heavier uh, than yeah Dark it, dude, it's a more it's a more focused sound we had a more focused approach to the record everything we just did everything completely different than we did for dark divine so like me as a new guitarist and whatnot and jerry still being like dark divine was the first record jerry got to do for moths as well yeah because he joined right as they finished their third record. Yeah. So it was kind of a big learning experience for us too, especially as the guitarist. Cause it was like, all right, we want things to go a certain way. Let's make it fucking happen. And yeah. we just kind of united team guitar fucking got shit done. So it was definitely just a more focused approach. Like, and I think that's why we were able to hone in the actual sounds we wanted to, and, and just like kind of blend some aspects of Dark Divine, but also just like take some book, some notes from the old fucking records, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, the and, co- oh, sorry to cut you off, but I was going to say, and on top of it, throwing our own twist. Cause like, I love, I don't know, I love taking like ideas from like, I don't know, like post hardcore era music, but just making it fucking heavy. Yeah. Like, in a drop tuning. Putting so. your own flavor in it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, but it was dope because like you know I I looked through the YouTube comments just because like you know I personally I I think it's dope like I love the heavy shit you know and uh, it's cool to hear it but I wanted to know what other people were thinking of it and obviously like like you hear a negative here and there but it's like ninety eight percent of the comments that I read people were fucking stoked about it <clears throat> yeah and the videos are dope so like the first video that I saw was the hab- habitual decline that yeah. was the first one you guys put out. Yeah, yeah, we took we put that out August 11th when we announced the record. Now, I that's that's my favorite out of the ones that are out Hell right yeah. now. And I think it's just because at like 128 when it reads like, Bleh! like yeah. I I don't know why whenever I first heard that, I remember I think I texted Brian and I was like, "Dude, whenever 128 hits, here, you're going to hear some serious <laughs> shit." And uh I was like, "Man, like that just it was uh plus the video is crazy. Like I love the red and like uh but I wanted to know, like, like what's the, what's the I like? How do you guys come up with like ideas of filming, like of of what you want to do for a video? Uh, I all the credit for that is the given to our producers and our directors for that. We worked with uh, a crew in Ohio, yeah, uh, Columbus. They're uh, Ross Thiessen and Josh Emmerich. I think that's how you say his last name. Sorry if I got it wrong, Josh. But uh, it's Josh, he means he 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 loves you. Just let him go. <laughs> but yeah, dude, we uh we worked with them for our video for all that you lost from the EP. Yeah. Uh, Chris was the only one able to be in that one, just because of like we couldn't all get flights and shit. So it worked out. They just did a video with him, and it was badass. And we liked working with them. We loved the quality, so it was a no brainer to hit them up again to do the videos for this album. Yeah, and it's it's nice too because it's cool to help the underdog, like they're up and coming directors and hell yeah. and art creatives from columbus so it's cool to have them on the come up to and give them a big project and whatnot but so we just gave them the songs like we just like hey do you want to do these videos yeah gave them the songs and lyrics and shit and they came up with everything really they they do they're so professional they sent us storyboards they sent us this like website with all these just like they gave us like dropbox links for everything they for everything after it was made like we got like gifts of stuff they gave us you know, behind the scenes, photos, clips, wow. all sorts of different promo. But 
yeah, before we got to that point, they sent us just straight up storyboards and just like kind of like like their ideas. Like they would take like reference images and be like, hey, we want to do this kind of shot for that and like create something like this and and make this kind of mood by doing this shot. And they really went in depth and explained what they were going to do. And why they were like feeling yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it was sick. We just, we trusted the process and just rolled with it. Dude, the video is dope. It's like watching it, like, you know, it's sick with the dark red and like, you know, the silhouettes and everything like that. And yeah. so like whenever you're filming this, like how long did it take to film that video? We actually did both videos in one day. Really? Yeah, yeah. Just wow. the performance aspects. Yeah. They ended up handling all like the creative, like, I guess the more artsy parts, the B-roll side. They did all that the following day. Yeah. Just because like this was all done during COVID, so there's just like yeah, restrictions gotta... on how many people could be in the area at a certain time. So you're whatnot, talking about so... like the 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 dude holding like the talisman or whatever it is in the in yeah, the like, the, like the demon looking like. So that wasn't that wasn't any of you guys. No, that's that like... was just actors. Oh, that's sick. Yeah. So like you guys went in there, played what you needed to play, and then they did all the rest of that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, like wow. So like day one, we went there. We ended up shooting the selective sacrifice video first. Oh um, yeah, and those videos were both filmed in the same room. Oh wow! They just yeah, they had all kinds of crazy like. I mean, they were in a warehouse type building, so the ceilings are so high. So they ended up having like all kinds of plastic like hung up to create like that weird like effect, like an aura almost. Yeah, yeah. And then they, I loved the idea that they had a setup in a circle and he's just running with yeah. that trailer. Yeah, dude. I, I, I think it's, I, like, I've seen other bands do different types of yours like, was executed. Well, where they're dude. doing like in a circle, but I liked that ours was like a loose one and it like was, uh, it's just cool how they filmed around us too. Like, I, I uh, I don't cool know. Vibe. I don't know who posted it. I don't know if you posted it. It was like the behind the scenes of them, like running with that. Oh, trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, man, like I love seeing that shit even more than I love watching, you know, the actual finished products of things, because like, it's so cool to see how the shit is made. Yeah. Like whenever you're watching that video, it's like very, very like, like almost not like glitchy, but it's like quick cuts. And it's like, uh, you almost like kind of lose your bearings. And I think that that's intentional for sure. Yeah. But it's cool to see how it was. And it's just cool to see the dude running around with that fucking trailer with the cameras on there and like how that turned into what it turned into. Dude, it was insane. So, like, you mentioned how he was running around. Like, he only, like, so for some shots, he would, like, you know, like, walk at a decent pace with it. And then when we were doing, like, the slow-mo, crazy, crazy action shots, there's like some time they're just, like, yo, just look insane. Just, like, I don't even care what you're playing. Just, like, just yeah. go and just go ham. And he just, that's when he was, like, running to get these crazy slow-mos of, like, different shots. And and I don't know how they fucking do it, but it's just nuts <clears throat> how, how they are able to, like, you know, the, the camera is going in a circle and the next thing, you know, it speeds up real fast and it's like on the yeah, other side dude. of the room, like, like, it's glitchy, wild. like you said, it's, it's almost like it gives you vertigo or just like makes you just feel a little overwhelmed. It's like, Whoa, what's yeah, it's going overwhelming, on? but it's like, it's not overwhelming in an, in an aspect where you feel like it's not complete. It feels overwhelming in a complete way that it's intentional. It, yeah. It adds to like the chaos of like this, like the, the chaos of the song for like, sure, like the mood that it's bringing. Cause that song has a, I feel like it has a weird, like, aggressive ambient kind of just uneasy feeling with the melody. Yeah. So I think that works well with like having those kind of movements with the, uh, the cuts and whatnot. Now you guys did both of these in the same day. Now that was at one point, how long until you saw the finished product of those? I think we got the finished product for, we plan on doing habitual decline as the first single. So they knew to get that delivered to us first. Why do you um, now, now put a pin in that. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Why do you guys choose? Like, how does that come as the choice of what you want to do? Cause that was, was that the first single you guys released? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how does that come up throughout the band? Like, how do you, how does that decision be made? We actually did a different approach <clears throat> this time around. It was nice. Our manager actually facilitated a survey thing where he sent us the songs on a list and said like pick your like out of all 11 songs pick which three singles you think should be the singles so everyone oh, that's cool anonymously got to pick their top choices and i think he had i think he also let himself vote and then a couple label reps also were in the survey too that's super so from cool. there he got the results and was like all right these songs had the most these songs second you know so from there like there's a couple that tied so from there, it's just a matter of picking like, all right, 
the what feel. do you, you know? And like, like I think, you know, mm-hmm. obviously one person leans another way and it's like, all right, yeah, we'll go with that. Cool. So we were able to just to easily decide on it. And then from there, like once we had the three picked, then we were like, all right, which are we going to do the music videos for? Cause we knew we were doing two videos. Yeah. So from there, it's just like, all right, which ones are kind of more appropriate, I guess. Yeah. Like what would work better? Yeah. Now, uh, so you said how long it takes, how long did it take for that, for you to get those videos back? Uh, I feel like after, dude, I feel like it was only like three weeks or so when we got the habitual decline video back. That's like, it was crazy. a real quick turnaround. Now, how far, how far out was this compared to, cause you said you dropped that August 11th. Yeah. So we filmed the videos June, like the weekend of oh, like that's June dope. 21st or something. So we filmed it in like end of June and then probably got first mix of the video or first edit of the video by like mid July got the final one by like probably last week of July. And then it was good to go for the August release, man. That's fucking nuts. Yeah. Dude, quick turnaround time with those dudes. Like they're insanely talented. Yeah. They, the videos look insane. They look very, very good. Like, I, and I love, I mean, like I love a music video. I wish people did more music videos just because like, I don't know. Like, like we were talking about like what the meaning of no eternity and gold is. It's like, everyone has their own interpretation of songs. It yeah. doesn't matter you know who you are you're gonna have a different idea of it than i will and uh it's cool because like watching a video kind of like helps fill it in a little bit and it kind of like you know keeps your mind going like if i was thinking of 100 percent a different way it's like that is like oh this is kind of what they meant a little bit mm-hmm. and like this was kind of like the feel of it a little bit now you put that out august 11th what's the response of it I don't. Oh, we teased them first. We, I had, I was filming just some clips on my phone while we were all at the at the location fil, uh, filming the videos. So like, whenever Chris was doing his vocal takes for that song, like, dude, they had so much crazy equipment. Like, we were like, if we're standing on this side of the room and Chris is all the way on the other side of the room filming, they had this monitor hooked up over where we're standing, where you could see what the what the, the videographer like. is seeing. Yeah. yeah. So like I just took a little video of like the screen and just like pan it over to Chris and then back over and you could hear the song going on in the background. So we ended up teasing that video like maybe five days before we announced that song coming out and we yeah. just gave him like a pre-save link for the song, like for Spotify. Yeah. That's like a thing you can do now, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty 2020. cool. 2020. <laughs> yeah, 2020. Streaming. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we did that and... uh kids were just like oh shit it's coming yeah so, like it was just i think it was cool just to tease them like that with just like a little raw just like oh hey we filmed a video <laughs> that's awesome and then just hit them with it but yeah whenever people heard it, i think i think it threw some people off with like us going back to like the aggressive heavy roots and i think every uh, everyone was on board i think people were very happy with it well if you think about it it's like the reason people you know, get into moths was like, obviously the first type of stuff that they put out. So it's like, people have that like preconceived feeling of like what you guys were. And it's like, you know, you, 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 like you man or you transform into like, you know, everyone transforms into Mm -hmm. what it is. So people are like, Holy shit. Like it's like kind of a taste of like what it was with the heavier end of it. And uh, that's dope to like, it's dope for that. Oh, for sure, dude. And it's funny too, because like a lot of bands have different members coming in and out throughout the years. And I mean, you, I, I would think that people would know fans would know that Moss has had a lot of different members come in over the years, but it's funny to me that like, some people are just very unaware of that. So they might hear a new album and think like, Oh, why is it so different? Why is it so different? Well, we have two new writers now, or or this is happening or with a new producer now. So people don't know the behind the scenes aspects of what's going on with the band itself. So it's even funny because like I've seen comments, like we did a guitar playthrough for YOTM or whatever, just so people could see like what I'm doing and how I'm playing the riffs. Who filmed that? Uh, Brian, (laughs) the fucking man. And then we, uh, Dylan filmed a couple pieces too and we did it at a studio in south side yeah shout out to brian skyline and dylan ross gone fuck yeah og homies yeah but yeah uh I, i've seen a couple comments on that saying like oh i didn't know they got a new guitarist like or i've seen even comments on like the video saying oh like dude the new guitarist blah 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 and it's like dude i've been here for four years i guess i'm new but like <laughs> i know I, I this is a comment i've written down here it says the new guitarist has been the best addition in forever and i was like that's fucking dope like it's it's 
that's fucking it, it got to be cool to like even though you were in there for like years it's awesome i know it got to be awesome to read shit like that oh dude it makes me feel great like i definitely appreciate the people that notice that shit or say that shit i even have some people like dm me on instagram like i'll get them in the requested messages just saying like yo like the new shit's sick or like love your guitar work just you know i, I think sometimes it's either just fans of the band or just like guitarists themselves or yeah. just, you know people that like metal so it's cool just to get some recognition on it after you know yeah grinding dude. out with the band for four years like it's Hell cool yeah. to finally have more of my taste and my input on the music and people noticing it it's just a cool feeling man it gotta be cool now uh selective sacrifice was definitely it was like a different video a different style video than habitual decline mm-hmm. you know it was there was more shit into it so like whenever you guys are going in to record that do you have like basically like a, an idea of what they want you to do like uh like you're going to be doing this. Like, do you, do you like have shit set up like before you even get in there or is it kind of like once you get there, they explain to you what to do. We had, like I said, we had a storyboard and then they also had sent us like this. They, I guess they drew like a little blueprint almost Uh, of like how they were going to have. That's kind of what I meant. I phrased it wrong. At least for the selective sacrifice shot video, they had a little blueprint of like how the setup was going to be. So I kind of knew going into it, they were going to have us in some kind of circle. Yeah. I didn't know that it was going to be us facing each other or whatever, but I I loved that idea because it just felt like a jam sesh. It just felt like we were just like jamming with each other. It really looked cool to like, it's almost like the, you know, like it almost gave me a feeling of like a house show. And, yeah. you know like you know everyone's just packed in and even though it was just like you guys in there it's like everyone's packed in and it just felt like very very uh felt like very it felt like a personal like experience you know, or intimate intimate's yeah, yeah, a better yeah. word intimate that's that's kind of how i feel too because it was just like like those are my boys like we're all just kind of huddled together fucking yeah because what's the song of you guys in the in the desert from dark divine what was it called uh, nowhere left to sink nowhere left to sink it's like that's a video that it felt big it felt like yeah it felt like distant not in a We're negative all spread way. around and yeah, but it's like you're in a fucking desert yeah. far away. It's like you know the uh, th- that video is like it felt so intimate because it's like you're close in. Everyone's like there. Everyone's just like you know. It was just like I don't know. And it felt like raw. It's like it. it, it, it I don't know. That's what it reminded me of. As soon as I watched it, I was like, I feel like I'm in a fucking like house show. That's it's cool, man. I, I didn't think of it that way, but I think it's cool to hear that type of outlook on it. Yeah, dude. Like it's. It was just like because uh, when. Whenever I was watching everything again, like I, I, I just I watch it and I I just kind of like note in my mind like what I'm thinking of because like I said, you guys have different thoughts of what it is compared to like you know the listeners of it all. So it's like you know I'm sure that it's interesting to hear the different aspects of how everyone thinks of it. But uh, hmm, man, it's fucking <laughs> dope. So I mean, tomorrow the album drops and. How many tracks? 11 tracks. Uh, what's your favorite? I know it got to be a hard. So I'd say I'll, I'll break it to two. Favorite track that I wrote is probably, oh, God damn it. Uh, my favorite track that I wrote is probably Fluorescent White just because that one is so out there sound wise. It yeah. just. Uh, Did you just release a track list? Yeah, the track list is out and everything. Okay. That's the fourth track on their record. Uh, that one, it's just, it's it's Moths, but it's just like, we, I wrote it in a different key. I wrote it just like, it's just more melodic, but it still riffs more. It's just more technical. It's something that like the band can do, and but I just, I, I feel like we showcased it better in that song. And like the hooks in that song just fucking smashed, like Chris killed it. Yeah. Uh, that, so that's probably the favorite I wrote. My favorite song that Jerry wrote. I'd probably say uh, the anatomy of evil. That's the opening track on their record. Mm. It's just it just has like uh, it just has like this crazy groove to it. Like when it kicks in, like when the full song kicks in. Yeah, it's just a great opener. He just has, oh, dude. He just writes the sickest, bendiest riffs for that song, and like just has this like almost like Egyptian feel to it. Whenever the lead kicks in and everything, it reminds me of like a different version of like, you know, the opening track on the first record, the worst in me. Yeah. It gives me that type of vibe for the opening song, but not as dark, more like, cause that song's also in a different key. So like, it, I don't know. It just gives me that vibe though. Still like That's, just 
a lot That's of awesome. triplet fucking kick pedals and shit happening. It's it's dope. Now, uh, I mean, this this record dropping tomorrow. Like, are you guys like uh, now? You you have like there's not like any like feelers of it, right? Like, you don't like put the record out. Like, uh, <laughs> do you guys give the record to like the label and like all those people listen to it and pass it around and give you feedback at all? Uh, we gave so whenever we got to leave the studio, whenever we left the studio, they gave us a rough version of it like not mi- like roughly mixed not mastered but obviously mixing changes as you master and change some things around or you know we give our notes yeah but yeah we just gave them that like first basic version of like hey here's the record that we're walking out with today mm. and like the feedback we got instantly like they loved it like they were about it so wow. it was nice just to just to have them relief. back us you know what i mean yeah yeah i mean like at the end of the day i feel like unfd is such a cool able to be on like they, I think they knew what they were getting into when they signed our band. Yeah. They know what we do. They know what we're about. They know what we want to do. And we're already established. So it's like, I think they can just sign us and say, all right, have do, some confidence. Yeah, do that, what you like, want to do. You we, guys have made it this far. Like, you know, we don't, yeah, I get it. Like they don't want, they don't want to like sway yins away from what yins do. Yeah. Obviously you, you guys have a process and you guys are good at it. Uh, but it's cool to like have someone that like, uh, you know, it's like uh, Turner's. Like I told Turner's like whenever they, decided to sponsor me i was like dude i just got to do what i got to do like i can't have like you know constraints or anything like that you just got to let me roll with it and if you let me roll with it you'll be happy exactly and like that's uh that's what i feel like is great because like there's no sort of like fabrication there it's like that's like completely like your feel of it oh i love it i'm excited to listen to it fuck yeah i am excited um so like what's the process now like obviously you know i feel like that this has been like a year long you know even more Mm -hmm. of you writing this and like doing this and like being this being fresh on your mind you know the album drops tomorrow what is the process then obviously i i get that covid is like a, a monkey wrench and everything but it's like what what is like what is the next thing for you guys uh i mean it's kind of up in the air like with covid going on and everything like we have a rough idea of when we're gonna try and tour again like we have tentative dates planned in 2021 that may or may not happen we might not ever yeah. get to announce who knows but like yeah i mean even after we got back from the studio like I was, I still started writing again. Jerry started writing again. Like I have probably, I have one, at least one new song. I'm super stoked on to do something within the future. I have yeah. a couple other demos from before that we ended up not using from the record that I would love to revisit and rework on. Plus, you know, we have so much time before we need to have new shit out. I'm just going to keep writing and just like honing in the craft and like get a focused sound again with what we want to do for new releases. And I think that also is where like, the new record comes into play, like just see how this does, see what works, see what sticks, see what people think, you know, like not saying we want to dictate our next move based on what people like or don't like on their record, yeah, but, but it's just food for it's thought. Good whenever. Influence of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now for you guys to do this and like, uh, obviously this project is going to be coming out. Like, it, like, do you have a sort of like, you know, relief that like, you know, you could have something out there and it's like, you know, you kind of can take a breather and like relax while you're writing a little bit. It's kind of like, it's kind of like one of those things like we put so much work into it. I'm just ready to like put it out, reap the rewards. You know what I mean? Like I'm just ready for like, let people hear it. I want people to hear it, dude. I, I enjoy celebrating the release of shit. Like, I don't know, dude. Like I, I just, I like enjoying it being out there. So like, that's one big thing I like to do when we release music. Like I'm going to fucking pop some, some champagne tomorrow. I'm going to, you know, stream the album on Spotify just because or Apple music. I actually use Apple music, but you know, I just want to just kind of be a part of it too. And actually one cool thing, since we're in the future now talking yeah, tonight, October 29th at nine Eastern time, we are doing a virtual listening party of the record on Chris's Twitch channel. Oh really? Yeah. So we'll be on there. Uh, how do people find that? Uh, we, we have it promoted on our band's Instagram. We just posted it, uh, okay. The other day. And I'll put the uh, link, scroll down in the description. You'll find the link. There. Yeah. Yeah. It, it should be twitch doc, twitch.tv slash broder. What does, what does he do? Play video games on there? He does all kinds of shit, man. Yeah. He, uh, I've never he, been he started, on Twitch. I don't even understand it. He really. started with video games. Like he still plays video games on there, but I'm sure, you know, Chris draws, he does a lot of graphic design. Uh, he does yeah. t-shirt designs for us, but, uh, I guess in recent years, he now does all his drawings and stuff on his iPad Pro and has, like, I think an app called, like, Procreate, maybe? Yeah, Procreate. Okay, yeah, so he uses that. 
And I guess he has some sort of way where he can like time lapse it almost. He can time. Oh, he, I think he can time lapse it. But I think what he does for Twitch is he'll live share his screen or screen share oh, or something like cool. that. So people can just see him like real time drawing like they'll just see his screen and i think he has a camera of himself too so he can like oh wow talk to people and you know he'll see the chat pop up and he can you know answer questions i don't know or, why for like i just was like oh yeah twitch is just video games but i guess they do all, everything. People do all kinds of shit man people on there playing guitar some people just do guitar covers some people are just dude it's like your own tv channel like whatever you want to broadcast you can do it on twitch man that's awesome you said that starts at nine o'clock tonight yes Wow, I'm excited. I'm excited for you, dude. Like Thanks, it, dude. it's 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 fun to even just be like some some eyes on the outside. You know what I mean? Like I can't even imagine like what you feel with it all. It's like I would feel like I would just be wanting to burst by now to like <laughs> let everyone like be able to like hear it and like put it out in the world and like got to be cool to like see all the positive feedback on it too. It's like, that's, it's dope to like read them comments because like, you know, I scrolled through the YouTube and like, I I didn't know what I was going to see there. And I was hoping that everything was going to be positive and it fucking was dude. It was great to see that. Yeah, man. I'm really excited too. like, like I said, like some bands go through some rough record cycles and whatever. And like, you got unfor- to, though. unfortunately the band has gone through two rough record cycles. Like me, I joined, whenever they're halfway through the cycle for their third record, the dying things we live for. Yeah. Sick record, but it just didn't have the right marketing or promotion or it just didn't take off for some reason. Yeah. But you know, you know, we lived through the two bad cycles and I don't even want to say they were bad. Yeah. Cycles, I wouldn't say they're bad at all. But because... It's just, it wasn't what we were trying to achieve at least, but we, yeah, we learned through it. And I think now that we learned and we fucking, took the proper actions and, and actually put in some more work and kind of focused our group more. I think that's why we're seeing the response for no eternity that we are. Like, Fuck I think yeah. it's just kind of all coming out the way it needs to. Hell yeah. You, uh, you guys got some merch out that you could buy, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have some pre-order stuff online. Uh, if you go to UNFD, uh, their website, you can go to their store link from there. I think it's through like 2400 USA. That's the merch line. But yeah, we have uh, a couple vinyl records available for pre-order. Uh, we have one that's going to be coming out in stores, I guess tomorrow once the record drops. Uh, Incredible! You could walk to walk into a store and buy a fucking record that you're on. Dude. I know, dude. It's it's, wild. Dude, it's nuts. I'll, I'll never forget the one time after we we're on the tour that we released Dark Divine or something. Maybe the tour after we released it. We were at a mall on an off day, just like walking around, just killing time, you know, and like walked into an FYE and I fucking found Dark Divine and I bought it just because like, dude, I'd, I've always wanted to just buy my own record at a store. So yeah, it dude. was cool getting to do that. But That's awesome. But yeah, we'll, uh, I think we should have a list of like retail stores that'll be selling that variant. It's, uh, we did three different pressings for uh, Dark, or not Dark Divine, No Eternity and Gold, uh, two of which were the online exclusives through UNFD's store and then... The one that'll be in retail, it's like a translucent orange uh, vinyl. So that's dope. Be pretty dope. Yeah, we'll try and update y'all with the store list once we know who's gonna be carrying it. Wow, what a time to be alive! Um, all right, dude. The ending segment that I do with all the guests, uh, you'll be the third person on there. No one remembers what you said, so we're just gonna <laughs> act like it's the same thing. All right. So cool. the ending segment that I do with all my guests is a segment called uh, Desert Island Questions. Everybody, gather up, please. I think this is a perfect opportunity for all of us to participate in some really intense, psychologically revealing conversations. So we're going to be playing Desert Island. Desert Island. Desert Island. Desert Island questions is where I give each guest three categories to take with them on a desert island to exhaust until uh, they rot away and die uh, because there's no eternity in gold. Um, <laughs> so the first category is three things to watch on a desert island. All right, uh, the complete series of BoJack Horseman. Okay, one of my all-time favorite shows. Fucking love how just like dark and depressing it is. And <laughs> I just think Will Arnett is one of the funniest dudes. Like he's just like all his characters are always just such pieces of shit, and it's just <laughs> so funny how he just handles it. And I don't know, just a good show. All right, BoJack Take Horseman. That. Um, fuck man, uh, this is always my worst. Bojack, I'm gonna go with uh, fuck. I'm just gonna say Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah. Seinfeld guy. Yeah, I like it. I pick Seinfeld over Friends. I feel like those two are kind of like competitors in the '90s sitcoms. I've never even watched both of them, but I know Seinfeld's better than Friends. 
I just never got into friends. I feel like it's like right time, right place for people who see that. Like whenever I was growing up as a kid, like my parents were watching Seinfeld. So like I, guess I that makes got sense. glimpses of it and like kind of liked it back then. But watching it as an adult and shit, it's I like, need to oh dive my God, into how it. does this shit go over my head when I was a kid? I need like, to dive into it. So many people have picked it for their desert island and I know that I would love it, but I just need to get into it. I feel like it's like... It's dated for sure. Okay, now. so do you watch It's Always Sunny? Yeah, I just started. So I'm on season, I just got to season five. Okay, dude. Oh my God, you're at a good spot in the show. Yeah, like but, I can't believe it took me this long to watch it. I was just so stubborn. I was like, I ain't watching that. But <laughs> the first few seasons, the quality of the show, not as far as writing, but the actual visual quality was hard for me to get past. Like it was almost like it's almost like that visual quality of the first season of The Office. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just, I know what you're talking Once about. Once it punches up and it just looks more crispy, it, it's easier to get through. But like, I just watched the uh, the team uh, or the gang cracks the Liberty Bell or whatever uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. called, and I was just like <laughs> died. Like, I don't know how they do. Like, I don't know how it's even like a show, dude. Yeah, they're like they're just so fucking like dysfunctional of a group. But yeah. like, I know like they're super chaotic. But like, I feel like. I was going to say like the dynamic of like the, the group of friends in Seinfeld, like they're all fu- like, they're all like crazy narcissists and shit, just yeah. like the cast and it's always sunny. So I feel like it's like, a I like the more raunchy dy- version though. Yeah. Like, like it's always sunny is like raunchy. And yeah. I love, I love that. It's like a more fucked up, silly version of something because there's a thousand shows that are just like silly and random like kind of like friends yeah like random jokes and everything but i just like that they throw like the piece of shit vibe in it like oh yeah i mean do they have danny devito as like the main star i still can't believe that he is i still cannot believe that he is just on that show for his i I don't even know how i'm gonna get through it all i'm only on season five i think that there's 14 now yeah that's fucking crazy it's gonna take me years but uh it's just weird to me to think that that's Danny DeVito and that he is like a, a series, like he's one of the main guys on there. It's oh, wild. dude, it's the best. Yeah, he's hilarious. I watched Who Pooped the Bed the other day. Oh, dude, I was just thinking about that the other day because I was telling someone about like, oh yeah, Frank and Charlie sleep ass to ass. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> you know we sleep ass to ass. <laughs> I just can't believe it all. They just, I love how they just shit on each other. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's funny, like the, the ongoing jokes, like whenever uh, Charlie takes Dee's diary and he's like, come on, can you read me a chapter? Because <laughs> he can't read. It just makes me laugh. Um, funny guys though. Okay, so Bojack, Seinfeld, one more. I was gonna say it's always sunny, but I guess after that conversation, y'all know I already fucking like it. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Trailer Park Boys. Okay. That show is so fucking stupid. Like it melts brain cells in me when I watch it. But yeah. like, if I'm on a desert island, fucking kill me faster. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fair. Um, okay, so uh, the next one, I usually ask people three books to take with them on a desert island, but I want to know three of your favorite tracks that you've been involved with with moths like what are your three favorite okay um i'd say first i'll pick false idol the last track of dark divine Mm -hmm. just because that one's special to me because uh when we did dark divine like i knew like they invited me to come to the studio like a couple months like maybe a month and a half prior to it happening because we were already on tour in europe at that point and they said i'm good to come out if i want blah 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 so I had a little bit of time to demo and do some pre-pro before we went there. But like, that was the only, like that song, like I didn't have the whole song done. But I had like a good chunk of it, but like, that's the only one out of my pre-pro that we used for that record. Cause it was like the most finished, the most focused one. So I just have a special place in my heart for that one. Just cause it was like the, it was like my baby for the band. All right. So I'd pick that. Um, I'm going to pick Smoke and Mirrors from the like EP that. just because that one, I just kind of got to do whatever I wanted with it. I just like, I was kind of going for like a early 2000s post hardcore vibe, just like something like, like from first to last in the used, just oh. trying to do it in our own way though. So it has, it's in that different key, just like kind of being like a little higher on the, on the scale of like the notes we're using, but then like you hit that drop note and it like, lowers it down again yeah, but it's still it real pretty level. and sad but heavy and it's just like jerry calls it a hyper ballad it's, it's like real <laughs> singing and bat and like ballady but it's fucking fast in those verses they're kind of thrashy all right so i think that was just a fun one to do and then uh i guess for my third one i would probably pick uh 
I'm just going to make it a tiebreaker with either fluorescent white, like I mentioned before, because of all the intricate riffs and just like kind of trying to take the band to a new area with like riffs and sounds. Yeah. I'd do that, but I'd also pick uh, God Complex. It's the tr- it's track five. It follows after Fluorescent White, just because that one was like, for me, that was like a sleeper track. Like I demoed it at home. Like actually, I demoed it on New Year's Eve last year before I went to my buddy's party. So I had the working title NYE for it. Yeah. But like I liked it, <laughs> but I wasn't sure on it. And when we got to the studio, like I had showed it to Jerry and Aaron. And they were like super fucking into it. And I, I was like, I like, uh, you know, so we ended up just like rolling with it. Like the producers liked it. Like, yeah, that's just cool. Let's use it. So once it finally came to life and I heard the vocals and all the shit, I was like, damn, like, I can't believe I almost didn't like this song. Yeah. But like, so I'd say that's that cool one like made a cool turnaround for me just because of the other dude's encouragement and whatnot. So that that's, made me really like this song a lot. That's a super cool, uh, like backstory of that and to hear that. Uh, yeah, it's definitely awesome. All right. Uh, it's, it's kind of like whenever I like have a certain guest on here that I might not like, I might not like, you know, think will be like super crazy interesting to a lot of other people. Everyone's interesting to me because like I'm having this conversation, but it's like, you know, like, uh, that Pittsburgh wildlife guy, that's like the first one that pops into my head. I was like, what are we going to talk about for fucking two hours? It was like one of my favorite episodes of all time. Just listening to the dude who you call, to, if there's a rabid <laughs> raccoon in your fucking house or something. Dude, he has to have crazy fucking stories of that type of shit. It's like, the wild animals are fucking wild. It's absolutely insane. He specializes in bats. You know oh what I mean? Oh, my God. Like, it's just crazy. Um, okay, so the third category is three CDs to take with you. This is always my fucking worst topic. I know. it got to be. Especially someone who's like a big music head. It's got to be difficult. I'm looking through my albums on Apple Music right now. Go ahead. Start playing the Jeopardy music, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, fuck it. I'm going to go with Outsider by Comeback Kid. Oh, wow. I love that record. I know it's a newer one from them. I think it might be their latest full length. It came out in 2017, but that one is just, I love the fucking hardcore punk rock fuse, like fusion they have going on. Like, it's just like like some of the fucking like beat down parts are just like super hardcore sounding but then like they do these real fast verses and just like have some like they'd sing a little bit too and the dude has a real cool like higher register yell and scream so it just like just makes me think of like early punk shit mixed with like the heaviness of like hardcore so yeah i know they're a hardcore band yeah but like i just fuck with it a lot it's a cool sound all right so i'll go with that um let's go with uh shit man i know it's a hard one but i'm not gonna let you not answer it i know i know i just need to keep looking i really like that shirt you're wearing thanks dude drop dead i know drop dead no big deal dude it's crazy every couple years i'll like cycle back to their website and just be like hmm, i wonder what they have now and i literally bought this and one other shirt like a month and a half ago and i was like all right these are fucking dope i gotta get them yeah all right second choice i'm gonna go with uh Everyone's all pressured. Like, you're like, oh, I got to come up with something. Oh, uh, I know what I'm picking, dude. Uh, Rolling Papers from Wiz Khalifa. What? Yeah. Really? Dude, I love that record, man. It's like, I like, I, I love Wiz's shit. Obviously, Pittsburgh represent, hometown yeah, hero. That's just a random pick for me. I, I would have never known that. I think it's just because, like, I jammed that a lot with, like, my homies in high school, like, 11th yeah. grade, 12th grade era. So it just makes me feel like those good times. That's the one with, like, like, like a roll up and, like, no sleep and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rooftops and everything. Oh, I love rooftop, oh, rooftops. Rooftops. Yeah. That, that, that one just vibes for me because it's, like, it's a good album. I love for the sure. lyrics on that one. Uh, used to not be allowed in the building, but now we on the rooftop. Yeah. That's cool because it's just, like, fucking. Dude, that's a perfect up. example of like what we were talking about before about like people's criticism and like how you like, you know, manifest that criticism into constructive criticism. It's like I'm I'm almost positive that was like one of his worst reviewed albums of all time. Really? Yeah, because people were like he's a fucking sellout. That's just like a, it's not his sound and everything and it's like, bro, who the fuck are you to tell him anything like but but that's a cool way to think about it it's like that's your favorite but like as a fan base of like the people that love the old stuff i i don't think that that was well received by a lot of people i could see that and like i i never would have like even known what reviews would have been on that record back in the day because i just wasn't yeah didn't in care that, about stuff yeah i like didn't that. care about that type of shit i wasn't in that realm just of like music if, whatever you like is what you yeah, like it just resonates with me because i just think of like the good the times associated of with it. yeah dude it's just like 
rolling around with fucking Ty Mats and, and, yeah. and Joe and Doom, just like yeah. listening to that shit. Like, shout out to the old Ty Mats out there. All the EF it. homies. Um, all right, so uh, third one. I'm just gonna pick 818 by Devil Wears Prada, just because I I loved that record when it came out. I feel like that's a slept on record by the band. Yeah. Uh, that band was always a staple for me growing up with like, you know, metal, metal core, like getting into that type of shit. Yeah. It was probably like the first, like, I remember hearing dogs grow beards all over and thinking like, this is like nothing I've ever listened to before. And, uh, and it was all because of like you guys playing it, like you and Ryan and Brian and everything. Like it was just like a weird time in life that like everything kind of shifted and uh, like my musical taste and everything, I just got crazy into all the shit. Cause like I went from listening to like Biggie and Bone Thugs and everything like that to like listening to fucking Chiodos and from first to yeah, last. Yeah. And like, you know, that's just like a, it, and, and it's all, everyone's like three CDs they pick. A lot of people just like it all, it's based off of like nostalgia. You know what I mean? It's dope to like, uh, it's dope to hear why people like what they like. Oh, for sure, dude. Like, it's just nuts because, like, I, like what you're saying, like you're into Biggie and all that other shit, and then kind of trans, like, I guess, uh, transitioned into uh, like more like emo scene yeah. music and shit. Like, I was like, for me, like when I heard like Prada for the first time, like I was already kind of like well dove into like pop punk and like the emo, all that shit. And then yeah, like yeah. when I first heard Prada, that was like the first band that was like taking it a step further with like going like that's what I mean. Heavy it's like metalcore heavy, and shit. Like heavy. I knew that shit existed. Like other bands had already been doing it before Prada, like Poison the Well and, yeah. and Destroy the Runner and those types of bands. But like I, they're the ones that I first heard. So it just sits with me different. That's dope. All right. Uh, so the third to last question is, uh, um, I always forget which place I do these, but third to last question, I am uh, sponsored by Turner's Premium Iced Tea. You know, the good people at Turner's, they work with me. I love them. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, I'm going to implement a new question. I usually have people pick out of a crate, but uh, I, I've been wanting to implement this into the podcast. If you can go to a gas station and pick one snack, that's it. One snack, not not anything more than that. You get to pick one. It could be sweet. It could be savory. What do you choose? Uh, bro, do you know how many times I go into a gas station on uh, tour every night and just get mad snacks because I, I want it all? Because you can't choose. <laughs> but if you can only pick one, I'll let you pick a snack and a drink. Okay. Fuck. Man. It's a hard question. It might be the hardest question that I ask on here. I don't even know where to start. I know. It's like, do you want sweet or do you want savory? I feel like I'd go for like savory, salty. Me too. I, like, I'm a chip dude. I love chips. Oh, I love them. I eat a whole bag of chips. I know. It's but I love sweets too. Too. I mean, like, yeah, I, I love a sweet too. In, in the right vibe, I'll, I'll, I love sweets. I, I feel like both sometimes. I feel like whatever vibe the person is in right now, while I ask them this, is what you know. It could be tomorrow. It could be something different. Yeah. You, know, you could just want like a fucking Kit Kat or like a Ho Ho or some shit. Right now, I'm just gonna go with uh, fucking the the voodoo chips from uh, you know those are the voodoo chips. They're like uh, yeah, voodoo. Uh, they have like uh, the gator flavored ones. Yeah, the, ga- the gator. Uh, I don't know if I've ever had them, but I've always seen them. Dude, they're awesome. It's like a Cajun like spice flavor. Yeah, I don't like know, New it's Orleans like or some yeah, shit. Yeah, and then yeah, they have one that's like a like a vinegary barbecue one too. I don't know why I picked that just because it's like. I guess they sell them here now, but I would always get stoked when I'd see them at gas stations on tour in a different area. But like now they have them here, but fuck, I'm pissed. just going to go with that. Okay. Um, that's fair. I that's love fair. chips. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> second to last question is the death row meal. So you get to eat whatever you want from wherever you want as much as you want. Can I just go to a fucking casino buffet? <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. That's one of our favorite things to do. Like if we play Vegas or like Reno or, or just whatever, like we'll man, just... the casino buffets are killer. Yeah, dude, because you get a little taste of everything. I can get some my, my Asian fix of like you know fried rice and all all my favorite like General Sos and shit. Then I'll go to fucking I'll go get you know the home cooked favorites of like mashed potatoes and chicken gravy, all that crap. I probably just go nuts at like some dinky little Reno. Hotel, uh, that's hotel casino buffet. That's fine. Uh, okay, that's a good then, answer. Then send me off to death row after. It's all good. <laughs> uh, okay, the last question that I ask everyone is if you could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? Take your time. You got to answer it. Alive or dead. 
Dude, this is hard. I know it's hard. That's why I asked. I'm trying it. to think of like a trippy answer. Can I do some weird shit and be like, can I go talk to like, can I talk to anyone you want? Characters, cartoon characters, no, don't matter. I'm trying to be like, can I go talk to like future dying me? Yeah, and absolutely. Be like, yo. What's good? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that would give me some nice insight on. How, well, I don't know because then that might fuck me up because yeah. I'd fuck up my destiny or like fuck up what my choices. It's like butterfly are. effect. Yeah, I don't fuck. It, I'm just gonna go with that answer. I want to talk to me on my deathbed. That's a good. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, that's a good answer. Just though. to see what I would tell myself to do different. Yeah, or, or to or to focus on more or to. That's interesting. I don't think anyone's ever said nothing like that. People have said, you know, talk to myself older, but like. I feel like the deathbed thing is way different because even if you're like 60 and you're older, you might not have the same mindset and the same thought process that you might have whenever you're like about to die. Like when you're about to die, you're like, this is it. Like, I wish yeah. I would have did this. I wish I did that. But uh, that's a good answer. I like that answer. Thanks, man. Um, hey, I'm pumped we did this. I think it went very, very well. I'm excited for you. No eternity in gold tomorrow. On Spotify, Apple Music, everywhere. Go to Best Buy and buy a fucking CD if you got a CD player. <laughs> uh, record players are a big thing now. Um, leave or uh, you know promote any place that people could find you, the band, where they could buy the shit. Uh, you can go to my personal Instagram at Fishney. Uh, you can go to at LMTF. Uh, we were on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, all that. You could just go search UNFD. Uh, that's our record label. They'll have all the links for uh, buying the record, getting pre-order items. We have different uh, hoodies and T-shirts available to, to accompany the record and whatnot. Uh, even if you just go to the band's Instagram at LMTF, you can just click the link in our bio and it'll take you to a link tree and it'll show you all the different places Everything you can you see want. shit. Yeah, it'll take you to our YouTube to see the videos. It'll take you to Spotify to save it on your streaming service, Apple Music, whatever you want. It'll take you to the link to go buy the physical records from our label. Uh, yeah, so that'd probably be the best place to go find that stuff. All right, dude, I love you. I'm happy that uh, we got to do this. Love you too, Strawberry. You're the man. Thank you for having me back third time love it i know you're the first person third third one it's nice to be able to like kind of be established with the podcast and not have to like i don't have to have i don't have no fucking rules i could have whoever i want on here yeah dude i was gonna say earlier when you were talking about like uh whatever you're saying like it's cool you can just like hand pick like who you want like so just it kind of makes curate it, more, it all dude yeah exactly like, it's your fucking show yeah nothing no one else has any influence in this and that's why i feel like that uh it's dope and i think that uh even though you've been on here three times like we've talked three different points in life three different aspects of someone in a band from like the beginning from like just getting into it and someone who's like in there and like working and uh i appreciate you taking the time to talk to me everyone else that's listening i appreciate you guys listening as 